Um, actually, from some of the conversations that have gone before, there was an interesting thing about the fact that everything's going to the cloud. We're software defining the lot, and there's a great Dilbert cartoon which shows, you know, Dilbert sitting down saying, "We've migrated our data center into the cloud. Trouble is, we've lost the password. We can't get into it. What do we do now? You know, and that's a challenge which is going to face us as we move to this kind of new environment." Uh, so I'm Grant Cayley. I uh, work for NetApp. I'm the chief technologist in the UK and Ireland. Uh, my Twitter handle is there. Uh, I must admit, I'm kind of relatively new to Twitter within the last year, and I've been ramping up my capability. So if you do post something on there, uh, that'd be grateful. OK, so I'm going to talk to you about really you know, what it does it mean to be a data management geek in 2020. So as we look forwards, you know, what are some of the trends that we're starting to see? What are we going to have to start thinking about? And really, where are the challenges going to come from? Uh, and that's what I'm going to cover here. So we've talked today about, you know, a lot about the public cloud, the private cloud. Uh, people using service providers, co-location facilities. That's the norm which people are starting to look at. Arguably, most customers like to think they're at private cloud status. The reality is that probably you know, less than 30 40% have actually got a private cloud in true totality of what they actually deliver, but they're trying to get there. You know, using service providers as a quick way into the cloud, using SaaS uh, you know, software as a service into the cloud, uh, actually hosting some of your kit in a service provider location is a great way to get there quickly. Uh, and then there's the hyperscalers using the Amazons, the Azures, et cetera. But the things we're having to remember about the cloud is that it is a rental model you know, for the most part. You're paying somebody to consume their resources on a per period basis, whatever that happens to be. But that's not to say that we're not going to see the majority of uh, you know, services move towards the cloud. As somebody mentioned earlier, Shell, uh, who I actually did talk to separately, they have a strategy to move everything into the cloud. And that's a bold strategy. Personally, I think they'll be lucky to achieve it in totality. But certainly for a lot of companies, that's what the CIO is mandating. The only trouble is CIOs generally have a two-year tenure. So you know, they're not there to see the fact that they never actually managed to achieve it. But we'll see how that goes. So the cloud is definitely something which IT is moving towards, whether we want to uh, you know, uh, face that or not. The other thing as well is, in the storage industry in particular, for the last 30 years, we've been delivering engineered storage platforms. I mean, that's what we sell. We sell appliances that deliver storage and data management capabilities. They do it fast. They do it more efficiently, better reliability than you could necessarily build yourself. And that builds a great TCO. But that model's changing. Customers are not willing to look at that. And they, they think that the reason they're not looking at that is from a cost perspective. They're thinking, well, how can I do this myself? How can I do it more cheaply? Can I buy white box commodity hardware underneath and actually do these storage services myself? Because storage is you know, typically one of the largest costs in an IT organization in terms of what they're having to spend. So we've seen the rise of really software-defined uh, data management software defined storage starting to come into, into the fore. And that's been you know, definitely a trend which we're starting to see. I think going forwards into 2020, we'll see both because there's a requirement for both really engineered platforms, there's a legacy for a start, but there's also the requirement for that availability and reliability that going for a single vendor can provide for you. But equally, customers are going to start to look to build out their own environments, uh, software defined. And also, they'll look to build out mixed environments of both engineered and software defined, really based on the use cases of how they're trying to deliver storage uh, going forwards. The other thing we're starting to see is really the change in the application landscape. And we talked, you know, we've talked about this through the day. If you look on the left side, we've really seen what, you know, okay, bimodal IT, I was told not to mention that because uh, I can't remember who said that. But anyway, mode one applications have always been that traditional, we have to deliver them. They've got to be consistent, they're stable. They've got to deliver because they're holding the financials of the company, they're holding the systems of record, you know, the, the mission critical applications, et cetera. Well, those, have been delivered for the last 20 years, and those are starting to change. So we're seeing a move away from that type of application into what we really see things like, you know, the third platform applications. And really that's kind of grown because the fact that nowadays the drivers for application usage are coming from, you know, what you call the social, mobile, analytic, and cloud type of trends. So social, you know, social, sorry, people are looking for support to come from social media, for example. They're not looking to have a call center deliver support. They're looking to use social media to drive that. Uh, mobile is the way that customers want to access the data and the systems which companies are providing. They want 24 by 7 access into those systems. It's no longer enough to have 9 to 5. I mean, when I started in IT, which was a while ago, but not that long ago, 
it wasn't uncommon that IT systems were pretty much scheduled nine to five. There was no 24 by seven operation. And over the years that has changed. People want 24 by seven operation. So mobile is driving a huge trend in terms of what we're actually seeing on the requirements of the applications. The problem with mobile is, as I said, you don't know when you're going to need the hotspots. You don't know when you'll need to spin up extra services. So you need applications that can scale up and scale down to meet the requirements of what you actually have from a customer perspective. And we're also seeing a different trend in terms of things like OpenStack, people wanting to build their own environments, people wanting to do analytics on data, for example. And analytics is probably the most powerful force that most CIOs think will change their business going forwards. And that has a big requirement in terms of the amount of data that you need to collect and hold and then analyze, et cetera. So the fundamentals are changing because the application landscape is changing because of really the kind of trends which are changing uh, around about the third platform uh, if you use IDC's nomenclature. So it's quite a change there. And if you look at where we are today, you know, second, uh, sorry, second platform, to use IDC's term, has been the norm. But that growth of that traditional infrastructure is slowing down. You know, the estimate that the growth in that space is going to be single digits over the next couple of years. The bigger growth is coming from the third platform applications. It's relatively small just now. Companies are looking, how can I move my databases to NoSQL, for example? You know, I was talking to a large bank the other day, and they have probably one of the largest Oracle uh, sets of databases in the world. They're a huge you know, organization, lots of Oracle databases, et cetera. But looking forwards, they're trying to work out how can they move the majority of that because of the cost of paying for Oracle licenses, et cetera, into a NoSQL environment. Because 80% of what they actually deploy probably doesn't need the capabilities of an Oracle database. And they will actually start to gain more advantages by being able to deploy databases at much larger scale, but without actually having to pay some of the costs for that. So there's a big growth coming in terms of these third platform applications that's going to change the data management and the data requirements that are actually sitting underneath. So really, when you're looking at how do you deliver a data management capability underneath that or a data storage capability, there's no longer kind of one, you know, one solution that fits all. Ten years ago, you could deploy from a vendor like NetApp, EMC, you, know, you could pick a storage vendor, HDS, and you could standardize on their storage platform to deliver pretty much everything which you were looking to do. That's no longer the case. There are too many variables coming into the application landscape that aren't capable of being fit by just one type of storage deployment. So for example, you know, traditionally we were seeing the requirement for shared storage, which was scale up, scale out, rich data services, uh, because the application doesn't provide that. We've seen you know, the requirements for single applications which are looking to deliver maximum performance and they have a different requirement from a shared storage platform, for example. And then going forwards with some of the new infrastructure, we're seeing a requirement for scalable scale out infrastructure that you can effectively grow on demand as the actual infrastructure environment and the application environment actually demands those changes. So it's no longer the case that in 2020, one particular capability, you know, one product will fit all of the different requirements which you're looking to do. So that's really you know, how we kind of view and actually, 2020, scaringly, is only four years away now. So every time I talk about this, I'm conscious of the fact I'm getting a year closer. So I just hope that some of what we're doing actually delivers before we actually end up talking about, well, that was IT 2020. Now we're looking at IT uh, 2024. The final piece, of course, as we've mentioned a lot today, is around about, well, data has kind of two states, effectively. It has that primary use when you're actually busy crunching it. You're taking care of you know, the primary uses of that data, your analytics, your processing, everything else which you're doing. But over time, that data then becomes effectively colder. And you know, people are looking to build the concept of a data lake that underpins all of the different capabilities which they deploy on top of that. And the data lake is not an EMC term. I know they've used it widely. Data lake was actually coined by a company called Pentaho, who were a business analytics company, to describe the difference between uh, storing data in its raw form and storing data in its kind of encapsulated, documented form, as in a data mart. So the data lake is really somewhere where, if you think about all the data that's going to be generated, not just by analytics, not just by IoT, not just by all of the different uses which we have, it will have to rest somewhere that is sitting effectively at a more cheaper platform layer where you can policy define it, you can build uh, global namespaces around it, you know, effectively look at what an object uh, platform could provide in that. But you need the capability of each of the primary storage and data services that you build on top to be able to push data into that layer and pull data back out because data only has value if you can actually use it and access it. So we're really probably going to see as we go forwards, you know, the requirements for some form of data lake uh, to do that. And it's important that we deliver it 
correctly, otherwise it becomes a data swamp at the end of the day, uh, and that's uh, to nobody's benefit. So as you look at the kind of data approach, the need to store data, the need to store it for different types of application use as we go forwards, et cetera, there's really a different set of paradigms that you start to do, and I've talked a little bit about this already. The first is providing uh, a data services platform that delivers rich data management capabilities. And that's really for applications that don't deliver that themselves. So, you know, for example, delivering integrated data protection, delivering uh, multi-tenancy, delivering application integration, for example. And that's been, you know, quite a traditional mainstay of where a lot of uh, storage vendors have come from today about delivering that capability to be able to push it up so that the application doesn't have to deliver those types of capabilities itself. And that's been very much a requirement. And obviously, API-driven, and we'll talk about software-defined a little bit later, is one of the key aspects of any platform, whether it's uh, data services or the ones that I'm going to talk about. The other aspect, as I mentioned, is around pure performance I don't care about any data services. I want a, yes, I want a fast platform. I want a reliable platform, but I'm going to do everything in the application that sits on top. I don't care about replication. I don't care about snapshots or any of that stuff that you deliver at a data services level. I just want the best platform for delivering a solution on top. And that's being typically driven a lot by third platform applications. They just want the most capable layer underneath. Uh, often they presume it's DAS, and DAS works to a degree, but then the impact of DAS in a failure scenario, particularly in a large production environment, you know, not the lab environment, but a large production environment, has actually led a lot of companies to actually look at how can I deliver that DAS capability, but do it with an actual engineer platform underneath, something that is not rich in data services, but actually delivers very high performance, very capable uh, platform in terms of reliability. The other aspect as we get into the cloud, and this is really about how do I now build a cloud going forwards? How do I build my own infrastructure that scales on demand, that delivers guaranteed performance when I ask for it? Because if I'm building a multi-tenanted environment that's going to host customers, applications, et cetera, I need to be able to build a lot of guarantees around this. It needs to be fully API driven because I may want to build OpenStack on top of it. I may want to build another environment. And it needs to be able to seamlessly scale, not just up as we grow capacity, but potentially actually to be able to scale it down and then redeploy nodes somewhere else so that I've got this full flexibility over how I'm building my data center going forwards. Pardon me. And the actual interesting thing about this is that the audience that is procuring and managing these types of storage is actually very different. So data services is typically being bought by the infrastructure team, you know, the guys who are used to in the data center, the storage managers, the storage team, et cetera. The performance tier is often being bought by application owners. They don't care about anything. They just want the fastest, most capable storage underneath to deliver the performance they need for their actual application. So it's often bound and packaged along with an application. And we see a lot of OEMing in that type of space uh, in terms of delivery. We also, in terms of the scale, you're talking about cloud architects. You're talking about people who are looking at building their own data centers dynamically and who are looking to do that. They don't want to manage data storage underneath. They just want to deploy something that's white box economics, drop another box in, keep doing it, have it self-managing, and just deal with the applications and the, and, the, you know, and the kind of open stack or other infrastructure that they're actually building on top. So there's a full range of requirements that you have there. And the final piece is, as I mentioned before, is about putting this data lake in. You know, the data lake is effectively providing the resting place for data when it's not explicitly being used by any of the other kind of uh, 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 approaches. And it has to be something like a policy-based management system, a global namespace, scalable to hundreds of billions of objects, for example, having the capability of being multi-standard in terms of S3, CDMI, SWIFT, uh, NFS, SIFS, all of those different access methods to give you the options of putting data in and pulling data out, and obviously being multi-tenant, and something that you can span across your organization so that you're not just delivering it in a data center, but you're delivering it for all of your data centers globally. And actually, data sovereignty is something which that lake also has to manage as well. Where can data sit, particularly with things like safe harbor and other rules that we tend to see? So here comes the uh, pretty much the only NetApp bit I'll talk about in this. You not be surprised that NetApp have capability in all of these different areas. So those that know NetApp, you know, we have the FAS and all flash FAS rich data services product sitting in the data services bucket. You know, it delivers all of those integrated capabilities to applications such that applications don't really have to provide that capability themselves. Uh, in terms of performance, we've had the E-Series platform, the E-Series and the Flash EF version of it 
have been bundled by OEMs for a very long time. It's the back end for Teradata. Uh, SGI used it, Dell uh, have used it, IBM have rebadged it. Uh, a whole range of vendors have actually rebadged it because it's a simple, reliable storage product that delivers maximum density and capability uh, performance-wise at the best price point. And then scale, you know, NetApp bought SolidFire about uh, six to eight months ago, and that delivers a truly scalable platform that is built on top of white box software, and you can just grow and scale up and scale down, but with guaranteed performance for every one of the tenants that you define in that uh, at a LUN or a volume level. And then finally, the data lake. We've had Storage Grid as an object platform, which we bought in 2007, so a very long-running object platform, uh, and that delivers all of the capabilities that you'd expect in an object space. And finally, you know, UltraVault has been a product which we bought, which is really a gateway back up to the cloud. It takes data that you write into it, NFS and SIFs, encrypts, dedupes, compresses, and then writes it out via S3 to your own object storage or into somebody else's cloud, Azure, uh, AWS, whoever you want to do, even into competitors' uh, object storage as well. So NetApp have delivered all of that as a portfolio across all of these different items. But when you're looking at software defining, we actually produce software versions of all of these different products. Now, software defined means a lot of things. We've talked about that today. It can either be a virtual machine that you deploy, or I really think of it as a virtual machine that is also fully API programmable so that you can incorporate it into your own infrastructure, your own automation, your own orchestration, et cetera. And NetApp deliver not just appliance-based versions for all of their cap you know, these capabilities, but we deliver virtual versions that match that. And going forward, you'll be able to mix these virtual and appliance-based versions to give you a hybrid approach to both an engineer and a software-defined uh, delivery capability. So if we take all that portfolio, which is great, and this is a portfolio, not necessarily, this is kind of extending out, how do you actually deal with that portfolio now that we're moving into the cloud? And the challenge you have in the cloud is around about things like, well, how do I move my data from my portfolio into a cloud, whether it's a private cloud, a public cloud, a co-location facility? How do I manage risk? How do I manage security? How do I move into the cloud and then brokerage across multiple clouds the economic costs change? How do I actually get back out of the cloud if the application proves too expensive? All of those put technical challenges that IT has to solve in terms of how they actually solve, you know, move that data around clouds deal with the different formats. One might be a Hyper-V cloud, the other one might be a VMware or KVM, for example. So how do I take care of actually managing that as I look towards uh, getting to a cloud strategy? And NetApp have what we call a data fabric. It's not a product that you can buy. It's a capability that is built across everything which we have, software, engineer platforms, et cetera. And that capability means that we can move data across platforms of different types. So for example, across uh, you know, our FAS platform, across the virtual versions of it, across the E-Series platform, across the SolidFire platform, into the UltraVault platform, into the Storage Grid platform, and provide that mobility that then allows you to effectively move data into the cloud. Because if you're deploying physical versions in your private data center, virtual versions in the hyperscaler AWS, for example, a physical version in the co-location facility, then you've got that capability of actually moving that data across those clouds as you decide. And we have the capability as well of switching hypervisor formats as you move that data to give you the capability uh, to actually do that across different hypervisors as you go. So the data fabric is really our way of giving you the maximum investment protection for choosing whichever cloud environment you want and being able to move that data into the clouds, across the clouds, and brokerage it, and then pull it back out of the cloud if you wish to as well. So very quickly, you know, applications are king. Uh, if you haven't read The New Kingmakers, it's a, a, an excellent book to read, but it's all about the application. It's all about being able to deliver for the application. And the, you know, whether that's a hypervisor, a traditional application, a third platform application. <coughs> to do that, you, know, you need a multi a multi-capable set of portfolio items which can actually deliver that for you. But one, you know, one particular portfolio item isn't necessarily what you need. In some cases, you want scale, performance, or data services. You need that all capable of being plugged into the application layer to be able to drive that. So you want to be able to orchestrate the delivery of all of this as you actually you know, go through that and deliver that from the application. The portfolio needs to be able to span across the hybrid cloud. I've mentioned that already. It needs that portability and that mobility to be able to consume multiple clouds as you go forward. You need to be able to have that because no longer are we living just in the on-premise data center. We're living in a world where we have hybrid and public cloud providers that we want to move those data services across and into as well. But the thing that you have to add to this is around about 
things like visibility. Because you're not just looking across a portfolio that's sitting in a data center. You're now looking across a set of virtual environments, physical environments. You're looking into different cloud providers. It might be Amazon. It might be a private cloud, a co-location facility. You need a visibility capability that allows you to see the performance, the capacity, the sovereignty, the location, the ownership of all the data that actually goes into that. And that's what we're building around that. And actually, it's on Command Insight as one of the tools we're building into that space to give you that multi-cloud, on-premise capability of actually managing your data from the virtual layer through the physical servers, through the fabric, through the actual storage that's sitting underneath. Automation, though, is key. And we talked, you talked about automation, uh, Chris, I think it was, in terms of, oh, sorry, Arjan talked about it in software-defined uh, uh, conversation. How do you provide automation that's not going to be complex? Well, the way you provide automation that's not complex is you modularize it so that you build storage automation that you can then pass up to an orchestrator to orchestrate across not just the storage automation, but the networking automation, the server automation, and pull all these together. So we have tools, uh, Webflow Automation, for example, that lets you build automation around the full portfolio that we deploy giving the, effectively, you know, who manages this? Well, it's still the administrators of the infrastructure that you deploy that build the automation elements that can then be combined and passed up to an application or an orchestration layer to actually then use uh, for deployment and uh, growth, et cetera, as they go forwards. But it's important when you're in cloud environments that you actually look at uh, how do you provide service capability? And by that, I actually mean service levels, service level objectives, top to bottom. If you're deploying an application which partially can sit in the cloud, on premise, in different locations, you need to build some form of service capability so that the application, irrespective of where its actual infrastructure or data ends up sitting, has the capability of saying, I must have these guarantees. And those guarantees are passed through all of the different portfolio items, the management tools, to ensure that application gets the service level that it's expecting, irrespective of whether it's data sitting in the public cloud, the private cloud, or in a co-location facility. So we're working on how we actually build that capability through all of the products to give you that, uh, that sense of, uh, you know, of what you can actually achieve there. And then there's management. You know, if you can't manage all of this across the full portfolio, if you can't manage your data and move it across the portfolio, move it into the cloud, move it out of the cloud, manage the cost metrics, particularly when you know, AWS is a rental model, well, you can't rent forever because the cost becomes too large. So you have to have management tools that will report back and inform you about what is the cost of your infrastructure, your data management infrastructure. Where is it sitting? How much am I actually paying to deliver that? So really, the data fabric, as we think about it, is not one product. It's not a set of portfolio hardware items or virtual versions of that that we deploy. It's about the whole combination of all of this capability. That's what NetApp's kind of concept of the data fabric is. Uh, and it's one that's essential if you're going to move into the new world of cloud as well as on-premise. So really, the final thing is I'm, I'm going to mention here is that it is about control. You know, you have to have control of your data. And that's what the data fabric is doing. It's about managing the data irrespective of how and where it sits. You have to have the choice because no one cloud provider, no one premise capability, no one portfolio item is going to be the right place necessarily for your data. So you need the maximum flexibility to be able to move your data across any of those different items. And then you need to be able to do it when you, can, when you, when you demand to do it. It's no point having to schedule a migration exercise or to do something like that. You need the responsiveness of something like a combined data fabric to deliver that capability. So I'll finally just leave you with a few questions to ask yourself as you go forwards. You know, how do I build a data management strat strategy that protects the data, that gives you the economics of the cloud? How do I automate it? And finally, how do I avoid being marginalized and become, because as IT moves to the cloud, you've got to become brokers of IT, not just procurers of IT.